Aloha, everyone. This is Larry Camp, and welcome to the Nobody Knows Your Story podcast, which just happens to come with a side of Hawaiiana. Nobody Knows Your Story is a podcast which I believe will impact each listener in a positive way. As you listen to the experiences that have transformed, shaped, and guided each guest, perhaps you'll better understand your own personal journey. Some will surprise, some will make you question, and some will inspire, but all will leave you in a better place for listening in. As for the Hawaiiana, well, that's just a big part of my life story. So I invite you to check in from time to time, or better still, add Nobody Knows Your Story to your list of favorite podcasts. You'll enjoy hearing the life experiences of people just like you. just heard three plus perform Island Woman. And mid-podcast, we're going to hear Kaiwai Punahele from Ke'ali'i Raichel. Now, my guest today, Rebecca Braspies, teaches at the City University of New York, focusing on environmental justice and human rights. She's a published author and is working on environmental justice comic books. What? (laughs) We're definitely going to need to talk about that. And also about a very different type of Hawaii visit, one that ended up in New Zealand. There's a couple of little teases for you. All right, Rebecca. Yes, sir. Welcome to Nobody Knows Your Story. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here. Yeah, and it's fun for me to have you here as I just kind of, as we talked for a few minutes before and I was telling you why I do the podcast. This is just something I do because I enjoy it and I enjoy visiting with people. And you know, it's a little bit of therapy for me. I believe it. It's it's really fun to talk to people. Yeah, and you're an educator and uh, both my parents were school teachers and educators. I guess I have a little soft spot for educators. I didn't maybe always feel that way when I was in college and I got a bad grade, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> that was on me, right? <laughs> well, maybe, depends. It's usually a joint effort. Yeah. Well, hey, I'll just turn it over to you. Let's let's just hear your life story. I know it's an interesting one from the the uh, information that I've already gathered on you. So take it away. All right. Well, hi everybody. I'm Rebecca Bradspies. I'm a law professor at CUNY School of Law, which is a public interest law school here in New York City. All of our students are committed to the idea of law in the service of human needs, and they go out and do public interest work across the country and around the world. It's really a very rewarding thing to do. I never thought I would be a lawyer. When I was a kid, I was going to be a scientist. I intended to be a marine biologist. Then I sort of, when I was in college, I got really interested in genetics. And I actually went to grad school for a little while studying molecular genetics until I realized that I absolutely was not cut out to be a research scientist. Mm -hmm. What really interests me are the social implications of science, and uh, particularly around the environment. And so I became a law professor. I kind of focused there on when you said you were into marine biology, because so was I. I've always had a real fascination with the ocean, have lived in areas around the ocean most of my life. So yeah, that's... Are you you, a diver? I'm an avid diver. Well, yes, we, we, we did get certified to dive. But after just a couple of dives, my wife got a little freaked out. 
So we haven't really gone back and done it for probably the last 15 years or so. But yeah, I loved it. I thought it was very, you get to see things in a different way, even than snorkeling, because we do a lot of snorkeling and that's fun. But man, when you're diving, there's when a different world. When you're down there and you're, you, you're not part of it, but you feel like you are. And, exactly. Uh, it's that weightless feeling of just floating in the ocean and watching things. And when my husband and I were in the Galapagos, because we, before we had our, our child, we basically just traveled to dive. That was all we did for our vacations. Mm -hmm. We went to the Galapagos and there we had these incredible interactions with sea lions because the sea lions love to play with divers. They'll come down and they'll grab your fin and tug on it to get your attention and then sort of dive around you and spin around you and you, you play together. And it's really cool to have this interaction with a wild animal initiated by the animal that is friendly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm wondering and probably wondering what what is this person here? Or, uh, or and, I'm using person, yeah. but you know, they're like, what yeah. is this? <laughs> the, and they're laughing at you because you're so like they're so built for the water and we're so ungainly. You know, they'll, they'll like spin around and you try to do it and you're like flapping and you, you look <laughs> comedic and you can tell they're laughing. But it, it was yeah, diving around the world has just been a, a real gift and it has and it breaks my heart to think about what's happening to the coral now with the warming oceans and the oh, yeah. acidifying oceans um, yeah I, I just saw I a piece on the there yeah I just saw a piece that said that there were some water temperatures that were approaching a hundred degrees which is just mind-blowing yeah off of yeah. Florida yeah yeah I went I went to the Keys a few years ago and I remember just jumping into the water to do a snorkel and and it was warmer than the air. I mean, the air was 83 and the water was 87. And I just, I've never been in ocean water that warm and it was different. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, hey, let's, let's back up a little bit. Let's talk about where you grew up, you know, just about some of the things that I guess maybe got you focused on, you know, where you are today, because I mean, a lot of the things that we end up doing as adults, there's a spark somewhere in our youth that kind of pushes us that direction. So yeah, let's talk about that for a minute. Yeah. So I grew up in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, which is a small town that is about three hours from New York City and about an hour and a half from Philadelphia. Um, it was a steel town at the time. The steel plant has since closed, but it, Bethlehem Steel was the biggest steel plant in the world for a while. They really dominated everything about the town. And most of the kids that I went to high school with didn't go on to college. They went to work at the steel after they graduated. I was always sort of a nerdy, intellectual kind of kid, so I was definitely going on to college. But that sort of living in this industrial town at a time when the economy was very precarious really shaped a lot of who I am. And in particular, it was very much a union town. And so my vision of the world, I guess, I mean, I'm, I'm part of a union as a law professor, is very rooted in that sort of worker experience in the large production systems. I'm very familiar with the, uh, when you said Bethlehem, I knew exactly what you were talking about because I think anybody, at least in my age group, probably knows of, of the steel meals and things that were going on. Like you say, it's closed now. And, and a lot of them have closed down because of just as things have changed in society and in the world. I think a lot of times, Things that we used to do and manufacture here in America, now we get from overseas. And I know that's probably contributed part of what happened in Bethlehem. Uh, the plant was very old and they never invested in modernization. There was a time for, I don't know what anniversary it was of the plant, but um, they offered tours to the public. And my mom took me out of school to go on a tour of this facility. It was incredible, but it was also archaic. There was a river of molten steel running through the middle of the facility. They had done none of the investments that would have been smart business moves in the 50s, 60s, and 70s that would have let them compete in the world in the 80s and 90s. So, you know, its shutdown was very much, I think, about a changing world, but also about a management that didn't see itself as needing to reinvest in its building and its workers. Yeah, and probably at that point to retrofit the facility would have just been, yeah, something they didn't want to invest in. Okay, well, hey, so what were some of your hobbies growing up? What did, I mean, did you do Girl Scouts? Did you do, uh, you know, a lot of the things that you know we did in our youth? Uh, were you involved in band or anything in high school? 
I was a theater kid. Can't sing to save my life. So I could never be in the musicals, but I was in a lot of the plays at the school. Um, I was a Girl Scout for a little while. I liked the camping. I didn't really like the, the rest of it. Like I said, I was an avid reader. So that was one of my big hobbies. And I wound up being on, you know, there are those, I can't remember what it's called, but this club where we would do like trivia history games with other schools it was like a, you know, which, which students knew the most kind of thing. I probably ought to remember what it's called since I did it, but I don't remember. And I was really into photography as well. I had a couple of friends who were really into photography and we used to go, just go and shoot in the woods and I mean, we are cameras, obviously, mm-hmm. um, or shoot the steel stacks because the, the steel was phenomenally interesting from the outside. Um, we were never allowed inside with our cameras, but we took a, thousands of photos of the various facilities from the outside. So Bethlehem's you- a very beautiful town, too. It was a town that was founded in the late 1600s, I think. And so there was a lot of historic stuff there that was very interesting and fun to take photos of. Yeah, I'll bet. So when you talk about being an avid reader, did you have certain types of books that you like to read? Like when I was young, I liked to read a lot too, but I was really into biographies. Kind of why I'm doing this mm-hmm. podcast, I guess, right <laughs> here. But yeah, I really enjoyed reading about people and what they did. And how about you? I was pretty eclectic. I would read a lot of different things. Um, I did like biographies. I liked a lot of science writing. I liked mysteries. I still like mysteries. That's sort of my escapism is I, I like to read mystery stories. But pretty much if it was re- words on a page and I didn't have anything else, I would read it. Okay. And as far as, uh, I guess, your education. So after high school, did you, you know, nowadays people take a gap year and things. Did you go do that or did you go straight into college? How, how did things straight work for you? Straight into college. I okay. went to Wesleyan University, which was a phenomenal, incredible experience for me. Because like I said, I grew up in a town where most of the people didn't expect to go on to college. They just weren't engaged with the world of ideas in the way that I was as somebody who was like nerdy and intellectual. Um, so when I got to college and I was surrounded by people like that, it was it was an incredible experience for me. I was a biology major, but the great thing about Wesleyan is you can be a biology major and take West African dance and Caribbean literature and philosophy and whatever else you want to take. And so I I learned to do triathlons while I was there. Really was just an incredible experience for me. I think I would have taken all those classes you just mentioned. <laughs> Those sound like some fun classes, but uh, were. I wanted to ask you a little bit about your family life too. Were you guys, did you grow up in a religious family? Uh, did you have lots of siblings? Uh, how was your family life? All right, so I am the oldest of three. I have a younger brother and sister. We are Jewish. We were particularly religious, but there weren't very many Jews in the town. So, and there was a decent amount of anti Semitism. So, it, you know, sort of for, self-preservation and so you could have friends who sort of became part of the synagogue um i married now i have a husband and a child they were 17 year old we are not religious okay that's and that's that people ask me i am part of that group called nuns <laughs> yeah so so that's i think that's one of the fastest growing religions or not <laughs> religions i guess so you have a 17-year-old son, is that right? Yes. Okay. I guess about ready to finish high school? About ready to finish high school. We're starting to think about colleges. We probably should have started that a while ago, but we didn't. So how did you end up, again, I just have, to, I know you kind of said the marine biology was kind of calling to you a little bit, but you did end up in law. Do you remember what it was that kind of made you change over? I was in grad school doing molecular genetic research, which there's If you're a scientist, it's really interesting. Intellectually, it's super interesting. But the doing of that research, particularly at the time when it was before PCR technology, before you could like rapidly sequence DNA. So we were sequencing DNA by hand and it's very laborious. It's not particularly interesting. And, you know, it's like I said, it's interesting intellectually, but the process of it is you're basically dealing with 100, 100 microliters of clear solution for weeks on end. That I was not cut out for that. I also realized, like in talking with the people that I was working with in the lab, they were really focused on the science aspects of it. But I was much more focused on 
the society implications of the science that we were doing. So I started to think, well, maybe this isn't quite the right fit for me. To be honest, the LSAT was offered across the hall from my lab. And I thought, oh, I'll take that. And I did took it. I did really well. And I started thinking, maybe I should go to school. And I thought maybe I'd be a patent lawyer, but then I realized I'm much more, I'm really just much more interested in social questions and in how to build a world that is fairer, more just, less polluted, et cetera. Yeah. And and I would think that that's probably a little bit more, there's more satisfaction in that than doing patents. There is for me, you know, there are people who love doing patents. I don't want to diss them or anything, (laughs) but it was not the right fit for me. Well, even back to what you were doing in the labs there, as you were saying that, you know, dealing with this hundred, what was it, microliters or whatever for mm-hmm. weeks, it, it almost seemed like, I mean, there's work out there that people do and, and and I'm glad they do it, but there are some jobs are just monotonous and it just seems like every day you're kind of going in and you're doing similar things. I would prefer a job, I think, where every day there's a chance to encounter something new or different. Yeah, I I, I kind of understand what you're talking about, though. Okay, so hey, let's talk about a couple of things that have happened since you've been teaching. I mean, I know you've done some books, I and have. and let's talk about that a little bit because it also kind of dovetails into what you're doing with the comic books now, too. Well, I I have trouble staying in my lane, is what I think I would say. So I just wrote a book that's a history book, and it's called Naming Gotham: The Villains, Rogues, and Heroes Behind New York Place Names, and it is a deep dive into the history of both the United of the United States and New York City using the people that we've named things after here in the city as a way in. And I think like having this tangible thing you can look at or see as a way into history is makes it more accessible to people. It also makes it really interesting. You know, here in New York City, I mean, everywhere. History is all around us. But particularly here in New York City, which played such a critical role in uh, the Revolutionary War, in the economic development of the city, in the country, the cultural development of the country, so many literary movements. We're right now celebrating the 50th anniversary of hip hop. And there's this great map that the city has made of the five boroughs of New York City just filled in with hip hop artists names and which borough they came from. And it's really cool. Like it's it's just so incredible because New York city is a magnet for it, for immigration. People come here from all over the country and all over the world. And there's this really fruitful sharing of food and ideas and culture and language that I find very exciting. And so I try to capture some of that in, in the book. And to use that as a way to think about who we are as a country, who gets to decide what counts as history, and who has the power to name things. So it's it's like, on one level, it's gossipy and fun, because I used a lot of newspaper articles as the as a lot of my sources for getting the, the lives of these people. But it also deals with very serious themes that we're grappling with in a whole host of contexts in this country. When I read that you had... Uh written that book, it made me think, I wonder if you encountered any of the street names or places in the city that have now been changed because of this woke culture that we're in now, or where we, you know what I'm saying? We, Because now we find out about some people and we're like, oh, maybe we shouldn't have a street named after this person. Did you find any of that while you were doing the research? Well, the most interesting thing I found was Van Cortlandt Park, which is a park in the Bronx. It's a very large really nice park. Uh, The Van Cortlandt family, very wealthy family during the the revolutionary era, they had a lot of people enslaved on their property. In the late 1800s, they donated the whole estate to the city of New York to be used as a park, and it was obviously named after them. But one of the things that happened very recently is there's a very large pond where there used to be a mill. It's called the Mill Pond. It used to be called Van Cortlandt Pond, but it's been renamed the Hester and Piero's Mill Pond after two of the enslaved millers who actually ran the mill at this site. And I think that's like a fabulous way to to make sure that we understand the fullness of our history. It's not just Van Cortlandt Park. It's not just the Van Cortlands who lived there. Dozens of other people lived and died and are buried there. Uh, Most of them, we don't know their names, but we do know these two people's names. That's very cool. 
I'm glad that somebody has gone back and done that because I do think, like you say, it kind of gives a, a better representation of the history of that area. And, you know, I think we're seeing some of that all over the place. For some, it's difficult to go back. People don't like change. And so if they're used to something under a certain name or seeing something in a certain way, they don't like to see it change. But sometimes change is good. And, you know, people don't like change, even if it doesn't have the political salience that recognizing that sort of who was participating in slavery and who was its victims has. And I just give you an example of that also from my book. And that is there's a road, there's a major road in New York City called the Major Deegan Expressway. It connects to the George Washington Bridge. So if you're driving in or out of New York City through the via the George Washington Bridge, you're going to take the Major Deegan Expressway. It goes right past Yankee Stadium. And everybody takes the Major Deegan, and I'm using air quotes there. Mm -hmm. No one has a clue who the guy was. I mean, really, nobody knows who he was. When Joe DiMaggio died, the then governor floated the idea of renaming the Major Deegan Expressway after Joe DiMaggio. And this is the road that goes right past Yankee Stadium. People freaked out. They absolutely opposed that, even though they had no idea who Major Deegan was. And even though they loved Joe DiMaggio. Yeah, like it's, you know, change in and of itself is is difficult, I think. Mm -hmm. Okay, another thing I wanted to bring up, because I think it's it's a big part of your story, is your husband and what happened to him and what he's gone through. Yeah, it's certainly a big part of why I wrote this book. Um, So my husband, Alan, is a composer and he was a marathoner. And um, he was in Pittsburgh in 2014 for the premiere of one of his pieces that I love. It's a fantastic cello piece. I forget what it's called, but it's for a couple of small, you know, small ensemble. That's the word I'm looking for. It's for a small ensemble. And he had a cardiac arrest and just collapsed on the street and uh, is very lucky to be alive. Random strangers came out of nowhere to give him CPR. We've never been able to find them. But it uh, turns out that if you're going to have a cardiac arrest, Pittsburgh's probably a pretty good place to do it because there's a fantastic teaching hospital all over the city. So he was only moments from a hospital. He was rushed there. He spent about a month in a coma and then five months in a, an acute rehab place here in New York. I was there with him. And I really didn't have the energy at the time to do my sort of actual scholarly work, which is about environmental protection and environmental justice. It just, I didn't have the emotional bandwidth, but I needed something to do going back to that whole, you know, I'm a nerd and I like to read. So this research was, you know, a lot lighter. It was fun. I, so I, I did a lot of the research for this book while I was in the hospital with him watching, you know, trying to figure out like, is he going to, it's going to live? Is he going to recover? What kind of a recovery is going to have? And he has an amazing recovery. He's back to composing. He just finished uh, a really beautiful piece for violin. And, um, and I wrote a book. Yeah, but that was quite a process, right? Yeah. I I should have one more thing to, because it's not obvious that necessarily the connection. Um, And that is that we used to drive the Major Deegan Expressway to go visit my parents in Pennsylvania. They still live in Pennsylvania. So we had to leave the city and we would take the Major Deegan Expressway. And we also did not know who Major Deegan was. And But anybody who has taken the Major Deegan Expressway knows that to take the expressway means to be stuck in traffic and to be sitting on the highway, not moving. I used to always curse. I'm very bad in traffic. I'm grumpy. I not well behaved. And I'd be like, who is this guy? I hate Major Deegan. And my husband would always just sort of mock me and be like, you should find out who he is. You know, even investigating who Major Deegan was while I was in the hospital with him, it was really a way to connect with the past that we shared and, you know, hopefully the the future that we would have. Okay. Well, I'm going to ask the question everybody wants to know. Who is Major Deegan? <laughs> Who is Major Deegan? Well, he actually is way less interesting than you, you might expect, given <laughs> that he has this um, made this really important road named after him. I mean, I sort of assumed he would turn out to be a war hero, but he wasn't. Um, he was a major. He was in the World War I American Expeditionary Force, but he never left New York. He served throughout the entire war here in New York. He was an architect, so he was spent the war designing fortifications, which, you know, it's important work, and I'm sure he did it pretty well, but it's not exactly the stuff of legend. 
He helped form the American Legion after the war, and that's probably what he's best known for. He was the, the New York commander of the American Legion, and then he was the tenement commissioner here in New York City. And the tenement commissioner is like the commissioner of buildings would be now. So it was a mayor, it was appointed by the mayor, and it was his job to implement the laws that were that had been passed by the New York legislature about safety in buildings. And a lot of the rules that we have around the country in terms of bedrooms have to have two means of egress, um, every bedroom has to have a window, right? Those laws, those regulations come to us from the tenement codes that Major Deegan was in charge of enforcing. He also died young and apparently was very popular in political circles. And that's how he got a road named after him. There's a lot more, you know, there's a lot of details, but that's the big story. Yeah. And when it just shows that when you dig into somebody's life, oh, Major Deegan, well, who's that? And there's quite a bit to him, you know, even though, like you say, he wasn't some, I'm, I'm sure a lot of people who r- drive on that think, oh, he must have been a big war hero. Because, right. Died but, in battle. Yes. In troops. Kind yes, of exactly. Nope. Yeah. Okay.
Got to talk about your trip to Hawaii and <laughs> and and all that that you know yeah. just because it's not a normal trip. As a matter of fact, I've talked to a lot of people about Hawaii. You're the only one that's had a, a visit like this that I'm aware of. So let's hear about that a little bit. Well, I have only been to Hawaii once in my life, and I flew in in I'm trying to remember late November 1999 because I was getting onto the bark Endeavor, which is a replica of the ship that Captain Cook sailed uh, when he officially went to see the transit of Venus and when he discovered in air quotes uh, Australia, because obviously there were people living in Australia, but he was the first European to um, see the continent. And so the Endeavor is a replica of the ship that he sailed in. It is an Australian ship, and it was making an around-the-world voyage, and I was on it from the Kauai to New Zealand leg of the trip. Being that it's a replica, if I'm not mistaken, is wasn't it a wood ship, a wooden ship? I mean, and you're going, that's a long distance from Hawaii to New Zealand. I mean, I've flown it. it. I just flew it in January, and it was a long flight. You know? Well, it takes a lot longer to sail it, especially on a, <laughs> a three-masted wooden ship. Um, it was a square rig ship, for those of you who know about, about sail, sails. I was part of the foremast watch. There were about 50 of us. It takes about 55 people to sail the ship. We're divided up into three watches based on the three masts. And we, you know, we ran the ship. I climbed the riggings and I furled and unfurled sails. And I would sometimes would see, I called it driving the ship, but really it was, you know, at that big wooden steering wheel with mm -hmm. all the handles on it, mm -hmm. dri you know, driving the ship. I didn't get to set the coordinates. We um, had some lessons on how to use sextants while we were on the ship new trigonometry had practical applications, right? I mean, I always feel like if they took kids out in the middle of the water and said, okay, find your way home, they'd be a lot more interested in trigonometry. <laughs> how did you get on the ship? I, I want to ask that because if there was only 55 people, how did you become one of them? It was pretty random. And I have to say, I had the least sailing experience of anybody on the ship. I saw the ship Months earlier, maybe even a year earlier in Philadelphia, I was I was in practice. It was before I became an academic. I was a, a lawyer in Philadelphia and I was walking my dog by the waterfront and I saw this beautiful wooden ship. And I stopped to talk to the people and they were telling me that they were the endeavor. They were on an around the world trip and they were like, oh, well, we're, we're sailing to New York. You could come with us. And it was going to be like a three day sail from Philadelphia to New York. And I'm thinking, I'm going to be in court. I can't just like get on a boat and go. But uh, maybe the next year, I don't remember the timing exactly, but I was already teaching. I was in New York. And I, somehow wooden ships came up in conversation. I have no idea how. And I said, oh, I saw this ship once. It was really cool. It was called the Endeavor. And they took passengers. Whoever I was with said, you know, I bet they have a website. And this was... You know, it was 1999, so it wasn't, or 98 maybe even. It wasn't a given that there was a website and the internet and all that stuff. But I went home and I looked on my dial-up computer, and there was indeed a website, and it had this little icon that said, be part of our crew. And I clicked on it, and it turned out that if somebody covered my last class for me, this sale would fit perfectly into my break between the fall semester and the spring semester. And a friend of mine covered the class for me. And I, you know, I applied and the application, because it's an Australian ship, it was a very light application process. They ask four questions. Will you climb the mast? I figured that was non-negotiable. So I said, yes. Uh, do you get seasick? I figured that a 50-50 shot. So I said, no. 
can you swim 50 meters fully clothed? I knew I could do that. So I said, yes. And then the fourth question was, what is your blue water sailing experience? And to be honest, I wasn't even sure exactly what that meant. I knew I didn't have any. So I wrote the Staten Island Ferry. Figured I'd at least get a humor uh, (laughs) response. And when I got a letter from them saying, we are delighted to invite you to be part of our crew, I, I couldn't believe that they accepted me. So I had to get to Kauai because the ship was leaving from Kauai. And I'll, I'll never forget flying into Kauai and looking down and seeing, because you could see the port from the air and all these enormous container ships. And then this tiny little, it looked like a toy, wooden thing that I could see. And I, was, I just remember thinking, what am I doing? But I got on the ship and I cl- you had to climb the mast before we, before we left to prove that you would do it. And I did it. I was terrified. I was quite frankly terrified every time I climbed the mast, but I did it a lot, sometimes in storms. It was the adventure of a lifetime. I loved sailing. I totally understand why people ran away to sea. And for six weeks, my only problem was that my light, my watch didn't have a light on it. So at night when I was on the 12 to four watch or the eight to 12 watch, I didn't know what time it was. I had no other problems. So you did not get seasick. I I did not get seasick. I was lucky. Uh, The people who did get seasick, it turns out nobody is seasick for more than three days. So the people who were seasick were like laying limply on the, on the deck for three days. And the, the crew had buckets by them because people were throwing up and they wrote like little smiley faces on the bottom of the bucket. And, but after three days, they picked themselves up. They were part of the crew. And we stopped in Fiji. We were only there for a day, but some of those same people got seasick again. I felt so bad for them. Just I'm a one, day on land did that. Yeah. I'm one that gets seasick, yeah. but I discovered years ago that if I take this pill called meclizine every eight hours, I'm good to go. And so we've, we've been on, I don't know, 20 cruises and we just did a 12 day out of New Zealand in January. And I didn't, I don't even feel sick. So good. it's, yeah, but I have before I discovered that and that's no fun. So no, it, good it, for you. Was, you didn't have to encounter that at least. Yes. I was lucky because I had no idea. Yeah. So six weeks, I was going to ask you how long it took. Yeah. So six weeks yeah. on that little wooden ship. It was our world. <laughs> um, yeah. It was one day. The captain, as he said, parked the ship. We weared the ship, turned it sideways, and and we swam in the ocean. We like jumped over the side of the ship and swam in the ocean. Um, but other than that, we were just on deck working. You know, it, t- it takes it's a lot of work to sail a ship like that. So we were pretty much working all day. We had a lot of leisure time as well. We stopped in Kiribati, but we couldn't get off the ship because there was nobody to process us. I don't know what island we were at in the Kiribati. But the captain went ashore to see if there was somebody who could approve us to go ashore. And the people were like, "Eh, there's a police officer like an hour and a half walk away. You could try. So that wasn't going to happen. But we did get to enjoy the beautiful harbor there. And then we stopped in Fiji for a day. And then we sailed into New Zealand. It was almost New Year's Eve, 1999. So it was going to be Y2K. Mm-hmm. And I figured, well, you know, if the world's going to end, this is probably a pretty good place for me to be. <laughs> yeah. But I was did pretty you, sure the world wasn't going to end. Did you guys go into Auckland? Um, we sailed into Wellington. Wellington, okay. Yeah. Well, that's an experience. I'm telling you, I've talked to a lot of people about Hawaii, but nobody's ever had an experience like that. Well, as we left Kauai, it, it was actually, it was amazing. Because, of course, Captain Cook was uh, died in in. Hawaii, right? He was killed. Um, yeah, Kealakekua his, Bay on the Big Island. Yeah, on his third voyage. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it was a different ship. It was the Resolution. But as we left the harbor, some outrigger canoes canoed out to meet us, and there was an exchange of gifts in a reconciliation ceremony, and it was really incredibly moving. And uh, one of the big memories I have of the start of that trip because I don't remember very much from the beginning because I was so nervous about being on the ship but that was really amazing and overall that whole trip was the adventure of a lifetime and I've sort of done a lot of really cool things in my life but nothing to compare to that and when you went home I guess you then flew from New Zealand and you went back to New York is that what you went back to New York and went back to teaching and my students that semester said I was like the zen law professor I was so mellow and um, I guess I brought some of that sea, 
sort of steadiness back with me. I I think it wore off by now, but yeah, yeah. We we know you've gone to the Galapagos. We know you've gone to and done this incredible six week journey to New Zealand. Are there a couple other? Because I know you travel a lot. Are there a couple other highlights that you want to just mention that uh, you've done? I had a fellowship through the Henry Luce Foundation to spend a year in Taipei, Taiwan. I spent my time, I was uh, an advisor to the Ministry of the Environment there. It was fascinating. I really enjoyed it. I spent a lot of time learning Mandarin. So I then spent the next couple of years, again, this was before I had kids, uh, going back every summer to the mainland China, to the People's Republic of China, trying to keep the language up. And I had really good friends there. And so I would sort of land in, in Beijing, see my friends and who lived there, and then go somewhere. I went all over China on the trains. Really fascinating uh, time to be there. I was on a train to Urumqi, which is uh, far west China. It's the, the part of China where the, there's a very large Uyghur Muslim population. When the... International Olympic Committee announced that Beijing was going to get to 2008 Olympics. And I was on the train and um, the conductor had said 1022 to me when he took my ticket. And I was like, I have no idea what that means, but okay. And I like was like, what does that mean? What could that mean? At 1022, that's when the, the Olympic Committee announced it. And you heard this shout up and down the train, Beijing, Beijing. And people were so excited. Yeah. that Would that have been like late 90s? Yeah, it was, uh, I think it might have been 2000. Okay. So some, a lot of visiting to uh, China again, uh, somewhere most of us have not been. Yeah. <laughs> you, you, you've you gone to places I, I know of, but have never visited. I'd, I'd love to go to the Galapagos, but you know, it's a long ways away and it's pretty spendy it is, too, you know. It is a long ways away. It was, uh, yeah, we were on a very small liveaboard because we were diving. Um, I mean, we we saw all the islands and the turtles and and all the, the boobies, and it was incredible. But our main reason to go there was to dive. It was it, it gives you a a vision of what the world might have been like before before humans sort of altered every ecosystem on the planet because the proliferation of life was unbelievable. Everywhere you looked was some kind of a living creature. I remember at one point, it, it's not coral, so you can touch the rocks when you're diving. So at one point, my husband and I were both grabbing onto rocks because our guide was telling us something. And we looked and next to both of our hands, there were moray eels. It was just like random. Um, at one point, he and I were, I don't know how far apart we were, maybe 20, not even 20 feet, 15 feet apart. There were so many fish between us that we couldn't see each other. Or just the, a profusion of life like I had never imagined. Wow. And, you know, the whole world used to be like that. And you're right. It's not like that at all anymore. New York used to be like that. There's a great book written by one of the guys in that I wrote about in my book, Adrian Vanderdonk. He wrote a, some, a book, An Introduction to New Netherlands, I think it's called, in the 1600s. And the descriptions of New York Harbor and the bird life and the marine life, uh, it it's staggering. Yeah, lots of change, and it's not all good, but uh, yeah. it's nice that you, there are a couple of places still in the world that you can see that, and you know, yeah. I think the Galapagos is one. Easter Island would be another interesting one, I think, to, to visit, just because it's so isolated and out there. And yeah. Where do you see, uh, do you have any trips or anything on the horizon? What's, what do you have with plans for the future? No, no trips planned. Got a lot of college visits with my 17 year old probably so you know <laughs> relatively local we're trying to stay in a, a couple of hours um i do want to make sure before we end that i mentioned the environmental justice comic books though yes yes because that's a, a labor of love that i do with an incredibly talented artist named charlie lagreca velasco we've written three full-length comic books that are uh, available for free download on my website which is just my name, RebeccaBratsby's.com. They're free for any nonprofit or educational use. They're, they're spectacular. They're so beautiful. He's such a talented artist. And they're stories that you could just read as a story, but they're also teaching tools about environmental law and environmental justice. And right now, he and I are partnering with the uh, UN Environmental Program 
to make a series of shorter vignette comics that are just five pages about environmental defenders around the world and the dangers that they face as they try to protect forests or oceans or uh, other ecosystems, rivers, et cetera. Well, I'll go ahead and put those uh, in the show notes so that people, you know, just a link to your your Mm -hmm. information on your website and so forth. Well, hey, Rebecca, sure uh, appreciate you taking the time today to join us here on Nobody Knows Your Story. You have a very interesting story. And and I told you that before we started. Now now you've just introduced everybody to your story. And and, uh, I know people have enjoyed it, no doubt. Well, thank you. It's really been fun. It's, you know, I I don't really think of myself as a a story per se. I think of myself as, you know, oh, I'm doing this work or I'm doing that work. But it was really fun to sit and to have this conversation and to to think about, yeah, I do have a story. Everybody has a story. And that is what's so great about this podcast that you have, but also, you know, everybody who's listening, like you are the the main character in your story. Yes, you are <laughs> for sure. And like I said, when I was young, I loved reading the the uh, biographies. And so yeah, now we know a, a, a lot about uh, Rebecca Bratsby's and what a what a wonderful life you've lived. There's hopefully a lot more of it to come, but I agree. I've been very, very lucky. I've had an incredible, I've had incredible opportunities and um, I'm very grateful for that. And we're grateful for you being here today. Thanks again. Thank you. Okay, everyone. Check back in two weeks. We'll have another interesting guest here on Nobody Knows Your Story. Aloha. Far away